Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody's having a, a good day. Uh, my name is Taylor Busby. I'm the uh, Vice President of Communications for Seeds Park, and I wanted to uh, welcome you, welcome, uh, you to today's uh, our discussion on the, the biggest cyber threats of uh, 2022 and what you can do to protect uh, your business. Really appreciate everybody taking the time to spend the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes to talk with uh, myself, John Lowry, and uh, Joseph uh, Atkins. A couple of notes before we begin the, uh, the webinar. We will be recording this, uh, so no need to take any notes. Um, we will send you, each of you a copy of the recording if you'd like to uh, have that for posterity's sake or feel free to share it with friends. Um, everyone on the webinar has been muted in advance. Uh, we will be uh, uh, having a question and answer period at the end of this. So if you do have questions at any point during the webinar itself, just use the Q&A box at the, uh, the bottom of your screen here in the, the Zoom platform. Feel free to answer, uh, ask any questions you might have. If there's any technical issues or any pressing issues, we'll address those immediately. Um, but we will hold all questions uh, to the very end of the presentation. And then we'll open that up for discussion with, uh, with Joseph uh, and John. Um, which brings us to our agenda. Uh, on today's webinar, we have two speakers. Uh, we have John Lowry, uh, who is the president of Lowry Insurance. Uh, John has uh, been with Lowry for over 30 years. Uh, they've been working with uh, companies uh, throughout the country uh, to help um, create custom insurance uh, coverage really that's right for them. He works with uh, companies of all sizes, small, medium, and, and enterprise organizations. Uh, but notably, uh, John has been involved in kind of the evolution of cyber liability insurance. Um, you know, basically, since its inception, um, he's, he's helped it to evolve into the fundamental uh, business policy that it is today. And also joining us on the technology side is uh, Joseph Atkins. Uh, Joseph is a, um, a systems engineer at SeedSpark. He is our a uh, resident uh, cybersecurity expert. Um, Joe, Joseph spent a lifetime uh, in technology, as you can see from his uh, um, his background there with, what is it, an old Apple II Plus or something yeah, like that's, that? Yeah, that's actually real. It's not a background. That's actually my first computer. So his office is filled with uh, a history of, of different types of, of hardware throughout the years. Uh, but for over 25 years, uh, Joseph has been uh, monitoring uh, cybersecurity threats, and he has a very deep knowledge and the strategies that, that cyber criminals are taking uh, today. Um, he's got his finger on the pulse for how they are evolving. And he also understands the tools needed uh, and that are designed to help businesses like yours uh, protect yourselves um, and protect your, your teams, your customers, uh, and your data. Brief agenda, uh, Joseph will walk us through some of the top uh, threats uh, that, uh, that we saw in 2021. Um, he has a variety of different solutions that are being deployed industry-wide uh, to help protect your businesses. Uh, and then we'll hand it off to John, in which he'll talk about some of the cyber uh, liability uh, programs, what claims examples are from an insurance perspective, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. Um, and then at the very end of it, uh, this webinar is intended to be uh, educational, but we will have a couple slides in which we'll talk uh, specifically about some of the solutions that SeedSpark can bring to bear as well as uh, some of John's uh, cyber insurance solutions uh, that he has available. Feel free to bail after the Q&A if you'd like to. If you would like to hear a little bit more about uh, what we can do for you, uh, please, please stay on. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Joseph. Sure. So first, uh, we're going to talk about some of the top threats that SeedSpark has seen, uh, specifically this year. And I know probably most people here have seen at least some of these in the newspaper. The first one is obviously ransomware. Everybody's heard of the Colonial Pipeline. You know, you couldn't get gas for like a week. Everybody was freaking out. That's your traditional ransomware attack. Somebody clicked something somewhere and um, their servers were crypto locked and the bad guys who are usually in a far off country uh, demanded payment for restoration of the files. And I think they ended up paying like $25 million or something like that. You probably saw that on the, on the news and everything. That's it's a pretty standard attack vector. That's been going on for several, several years now. Uh, it's gotten more sophisticated, but it's pretty much the same thing that it's always been. Uh, social engineering uh, has always been a, a weak point. However, that's we're starting to see the sophistication of this 
Social engineering uh, at its base level, you guys have probably seen that, uh, getting those emails where it's like, hey, I'm, uh, I'm the owner of the company and I need you to go down and buy some iTunes gift cards. That's social engineering. That's manipulating your people to do something for the bad guys. Hey, go get me some gift cards and send me the numbers or hey, wire me this money. That's social engineering. That's, um, that's going to be the new avenue uh, that uh, attack vector that the bad guys are taking and a, and a finally evolving threats. What we're starting to see is a combination of these two where they, the bad guys will use social engineering to get users to not necessarily crypto lock your data or hold your data for ransom, but they will do stuff to get in your network and then take your data and sell it. Uh, the bad guys have learned that once they, once they, uh, hit you with ransomware and they get the payment or they get the gift card from social engineering, you're done, you're out, you only get one payment. But what, they're, what they have figured out how to do as they evolved and gotten more sophisticated is they've combined these. They figured out if they sit in your network and don't necessarily let you know they're there or don't do something that prompts you to make a change, they can just take your data and sell it on the, the black market and you wouldn't even know they were in there. And I'll, I have some examples of that. I'll, I'll tell you what I'm talking about a little bit later. So we'll go to the next slide here and we'll run through some of the solutions that we have. So first off, uh, one of the things that SeedSpark does, uh, there is just an ast astronomical amount of data uh, that is generated even from your basic you know, 10 or 15 person network. It's an incredible amount of data. So no human can monitor all that. So what SeedSpark does and what we have done in the past is we have a net, a network and endpoint security. Network security is, uh, that would be your traditional router. Uh, now we've started to use uh, uh, cloud-based routers that leverage AI. You'll hear me talk about AI a lot, but leverage AI to scan your network, uh, scan, you know, not necessarily, it scans every bit of data coming in and out of the network because Nowadays, it doesn't have to be a virus on your computer that's easily detectable. It can be somebody's in your printer. Uh, a few years ago, the Bellagio Hotel in Vegas got hacked and they couldn't figure out how they got hacked. They got hacked because uh, some bad guys figured out they could hack the fish tank and they actually got on the fish tank controller and installed software and they'd never even thought of that. So the bad guys were coming through the fish tank and getting on the servers internally and that's how the Bellagio got hacked. Um, so we utilize uh, network-based security, firewalls, uh, uh, you know, stuff like that, and also scanners. And we also use uh, endpoint security as well. That would be your traditional AV, but nowadays the AV is um, AI-based, whereas um, in the old days you would have like a definition file where it would download and then it would run based off that file. That's what it would scan for, but nowadays... The, the sophistication has gotten to the point where the, the, the bad guys change that so fast that the definitions can't keep up. So now the good guys have AI-based uh, endpoint security, and that actually monitors or actually looks at your computer and sees what it's doing. And if it does something just odd, it will alert and actually take remediation steps. Some of the solutions that we use can actually disconnect your computer from the network if it detects that it is uh, failing. John will talk about this later, but some of John's, uh, some of the new policies that we're seeing for insurance actually now require you to have AI-based endpoint security uh, on the computers uh, for some of the different levels. Let's go to the next one. So one way you can protect yourself, and I know everybody's probably heard of this, is backup and disaster recovery. So this has evolved. In the, in the old days, it was just um, taking a backup of your files and just putting it on a USB drive or putting it on a tape and putting it in a drawer somewhere. Nowadays, the, ba the bad guys actually know how to get in there and they, will, they know to look for those and they wipe them out before they do the bad stuff on your data or whatever. So what, they, what we do now is you, you need to have a backup solution that actually goes to a device on site. This is typically the, the way it works goes to a device on site, it encrypts that, it encrypts it in transit and at rest, meaning that the bad guys, you know, you just can't show up and open up those backups. You have to have special keys, you have to have multi-factor, which is the, 
the thing like oh, when you log into your bank, it sends a text message. You have to have all these steps to get to those backups. Then those backups are also uploaded into the cloud for offsite storage. These can be uh, these can be located anywhere. It can be you know non. It doesn't have to be region specific. So you can actually use it as a disaster recovery plan in case a hurricane comes through and knocks out all the power, the water. You know you can't use the uh, your facility. Uh, then you can actually spin your servers up or your data up in the in the cloud somewhere else off site. Um, and so this this future proofs your uh, system from any kind of attack. This also, um, like for example, SeedSpark uses a software that is tested every day, it's uh, nightly, and we can actually tell if your computer is going to boot, uh, if it's going, how fat, how long it's going to take. So uh, we can get the uh, servers back up and running. Also, uh, at least the backup system that we use, and most of them do now, uh, image based, um, they will actually detect for hidden ransomware. Uh, because they're able to do the backup at, at such a low level, they can actually find hidden uh, hidden infections that that maybe have uh, slipped by other other places. And then next is email security, which I know a lot of people have have probably heard about. This is uh, a little bit different than your traditional uh, spam and uh, spam filtering that we've all seen. It's been around 15, 20 years. Now the, the, email, the email stuff is getting very sophisticated. The bad guys, you know, I know you guys, everybody here has probably heard about, you know, somebody's email getting compromised. You get an email and say, oh, my email got hacked. Don't open the link from me. Well, now we have AI-based scanning tools that actually sit and watch your email box. It watches all of the email boxes. It watches all the email boxes that are connected to it and other clients. And it all pulls it together and develops a brain to watch the email. It will actually read your email and it will look for these patterns. You can also use this to detect, let's say, uh, let's say somebody opens up, uh, you know, let's say I, I go out and I create a, uh, you know, somebody's created a Joseph Atkins three at gmail.com and they're emailing as me. It looks like it's me, but it's coming in to somebody at Seedspark. The, the um, AI will see that and will say, hey, you know what, that doesn't, no, 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 that matches somebody that already works here. So it will flag that. You can have it do different uh, things on it. You can have it put a, it puts a banner up there or it actually blocks it. In our case, it actually blocks it. But some people just, they have the banner. I mean, you probably have seen the banner up there as well. Um, so we utilize a software card, Iron Scales, and that's an AI based. And we handle about... We did about 50,000 or 47,000 phishing attacks that were handled uh, just last year. Um, that's an astronomical account, uh, amount. Um, those were individual attempts uh, that people were trying to get into our clients. Um, there are about 15 billion emails a day sent that are phishing emails. The, I actually monitor the system, our system, and that's probably the bulk of the email is actually sent every day is phishing or malware emails. Um, and you'd be shocked to, uh, to learn about how easy it is for people to get in. This is more of the social engineering um, where it will check the, the threat before it actually comes in uh, and then uh, filter the, uh, the email out. So next, next is password management. Now, uh, you guys, this is a new thing that people are really starting to get into in the last year or two. So what the bad guys have figured out is they don't need to get your Bank of America password. They don't need to try to break into Bank of America. They don't need to try to break into Office 365. They have figured out, hey, you know what? Your Bank of America password is probably the same password that you use for Etsy. Well, Etsy is a much easier target. Uh, a much smaller target, a much easier target to get into. So they'll go over here and they'll hack Etsy. Then they'll take all those passwords and they'll sell them on the dark web. And then everybody will try those passwords over on Bank of America. And a lot of them work. So what we've started to roll out this year is uh, a product called LastPass, which people might have uh, heard about. And this will allow you to um, generate secure passwords for every website or every utility actually that you log into. And those are unique passwords for that website. And they're, they can be very, very, very complex. Uh, they can be up to, I think, 36 characters. And this will store this in one place. 
and then it allow you to fill in those passwords. So even you don't even know those passwords. Usually you can look at them, but they're, but they're usually some, you know, very complex, but this allows you one point that you can get to your passwords uh, with, and you don't run the risk of duplicating your passwords. So let's just say you're using, uh, you know, you're using Etsy and Etsy gets hacked. They don't have your Bank of America password. They have your Etsy password, and then you need to go change your Etsy. But you're but you're not going to lose your email. You're not going to lose your um, your Bank of America and stuff like that. So we're seeing that um, coming up more more uh, now as well. And that's that's a really fantastic tool. And that actually is also in uh, John's um, side as well. That's actually starting to be required as well. Um, and some of the insurance stuff we're seeing. Okay, cybersecurity training. This is the big one. This is the human element. This is the social engineering. You can have all the tools. You can have the coolest tools there ever was and the smartest AI, but your users, your employees are the, always going to be the weakest link, unfortunately. So cybersecurity training is essential for any of this. Uh, you need to uh, train the users and they need to be able to understand what they're seeing. They need to recognize it and they need to take action on it. We had a client, uh, actually they were not a client yet, but they had, um, they had iron scales. They had everything in place. The, the email actually said, this is fake. It had a big banner. They had policies in place where if they were a wire transfer was requested, they had to call the other person that was sending it to, did they request it? They did neither of those and they ignored the banner and they still wired $85,000 away or as $120,000 was wired away. So if that's a human element, there is nothing you can do uh, if your users let the bad guys in. Um, I, it's like I tell people all the time, I can build the strongest, biggest, most secure door, but if you open the door and let them in, there's nothing I can do. So that's, that's why it's very imperative uh, that you go through cybersecurity training at least once a year with your users, and it's recorded, and it's, and it's documented that they did the training, that they are, uh, that you've ran phishing campaigns, and they understand what they're seeing. Um, that's super, super important. All right, so where do we go from here? Ransomware attacks will continue to get uh, more sophisticated. Uh, we had another client, which was one of the more sophisticated ones I've seen. Uh, they had a local server. They had a local exchange server. Uh, they were not a client yet, but they came to us because they had somehow bad guys had gotten onto their network, had installed something, uh, some kind of listener, some kind of data aggregate onto their exchange server and just sat there. They had, uh, the, the company had purchased a truck from, uh, purchased a truck and had decided to uh, wire the money. And then uh, the bad guys intercepted the email, changed the wiring instructions, bounced it back, and they wired the money. So that is a perfect example of a combination of social engineering, some type of ransomware, some type of, of, of access was, was granted at some point in the past. We don't know when, it could have been years uh, in the past, but that's a combination of the social engineering, the ransomware, the uh, data access breach and stuff like that. All that is, is, is working together. That's gonna get more and more sophisticated. Um, all of this stuff, especially with COVID now, everybody's working from home. Everybody's working remote. Everybody's at Panera. Everybody's at Starbucks or, or McDonald's. You don't know where your users are connecting in. Um, you know, they could be hanging off the, the, the parking garage Wi-Fi. It, it, we've seen it all. I've, I've actually seen that. So uh, you don't know where they're coming from. So it's why it's super important to have um, you know, some type of security either installed on their computer and also network policies on your network to lock it down. If they are not meeting those requirements, they're just, their stuff's just turned off. There's, there's no middle ground on that. So that's what we're starting to see coming up in 2022. Uh, it's just getting more and more sophisticated and more and more um, numerous. The attacks are getting more and more numerous.
And now I'll turn it over to John. Okay. Um, so cyber liability insurance. This is the tool that the insurance industry has created to respond to all the bad actors that Joseph just told you about. Um, so this is the tool to pretty much try to put you back to where you were prior to the cyber attack. So this is covering expenses um, associated with a data breach um, or a virus or other malicious activity. Um, so within the cyber li liability policy, we essentially have four um, insuring agreements that respond to the cyber attack. Uh, the first one, which is the one we see the most is the network security. Um, and this is where you have a network security failure of some sort, ransomware, social engineering, data breach, uh, cyber extortion, uh, all those good things that Joseph just talked to you about. So what does the insurance policy do um, after an event? So the insurance company, they're gonna provide you legal expenses as necessary. Uh, they're gonna help you with the IT forensics to find out what happened so you can uh, unwind it. Um, they'll even negotiate and pay ransomware for you if that is required. They'll help you with your data restoration. Um, and then also along with the event, you might have the need to notify a bunch of your clients or other individuals who might have been affected by this event. So there's the notification to the clients, there's any PR expertise, um, and then you might have some credit monitoring and ID theft monitoring for your clients or any individuals um, who are impacted by the breach. The next portion uh, you can go go back one more slide, Samuel. Yes. So the next portion is the privacy liability. Um, this is if there is an information or privacy law um, violation as a result of a data breach. So this is where the insurance company, the policy will respond with um, paying any lawsuits, fines, PCI fees, um, provide defense in case there's some sort of class action lawsuit, um, anything to do with your privacy risk as a result of um, a cyber attack, this part of the insurance policy will respond. The third portion is your business interruption. So you have a cyber attack and you are down for one day, one day two days, three days. Uh, this is going to impact your business and, and how you operate. So the policy will also respond to help you recover any lost profits, uh, any fixed expenses, any extra costs that you have gone through as a result of your downtime and not being able to access your network. And then the final part of the uh, policy is your, is your media liability. This is your intellectual property infringement um, if you're doing any web advertising, um, including social media. So if you do, re do receive a lawsuit from um, copying somebody else's artwork, their logo, anything like that, any sort of lawsuits that you receive from um, intellectual property infringement, the media liability portion of your cyber liability policy will respond to that. Uh, Sammy, we can go to the next slide. And as Joseph has already talked about um, a fair amount, social engineering, um, this, we are seeing this uh, more and more um, in the cyber liability policies. It is the, the fake CEO email, um, the funds transfer fraud on the insurance side of things it is a huge problem. It is people not paying attention to who the email is coming from, what time the email came in, not following uh, proper protocol. Um, so funds transfer fraud it, it is a huge issue. So your cyber liability policy will have limits for this, but I will tell you, um, it is typically a sublimit, so it is never the full limit of the policy, um, and, and that's a result because the insurance company has recognized this is such a huge issue, um, and it's a, hum a huge human error issue, and it's hard for them to get their arms around it. Um, and the second one is your reputational harm of you have a cyber incident, um, Colonial Pipeline, Home Depot, Joseph uh, mentioned a couple of them, uh, you do have some reputational harm. Um, so there are ongoing resources provided by the insurance company to help you repair that reputation so you can get back to the full, um, full float of your business um, and get your revenue back up to where it was prior to uh, the cyber incident. 
Um, so why do we buy it? So why do we buy cyber liability? Uh, we are all relying on technology, no matter how big or small your company is, it, it's part of our day-to-day -day life and you, and you can't escape it. So as Joseph pointed out, the threat of some sort of cyber event is growing exponentially every day, every week. It's not going away. It's only going to get worse. We all have enormous amounts of personal data on our machines, in the, on our servers, in the cloud um, that we need to protect. Um, and as a business owner, um, you, you might be subject to privacy regulations that require you to carry a cyber liability policy. You might have a contractual requirement that requires you to carry a cyber liability policy. Um, and one of the good things about once you do purchase a cyber liability policy is the insurance companies have great resources. Um, it's typically their own uh, branded web page with best practices on how to set up your network, um, how to educate your employees, um, and, and what to do in the event of a response. So it gives you lots of resources to be proactive before you have an event. And then if you unfortunately do have an event, it helps walk you through, who do you call? When you realize something's happened, where do you go? Um, a good first phone call would be to somebody like Seedspark of help me, but the insurance companies also have resources as, as well. And, and that's when your forensics, your credit monitoring, your PR, your legal assistance, and your notifications to your clients, that's when all of that will begin. Um, but you will essentially, you'll have an advocate to help you walk through of, okay, here's what I think has happened to my system. And then they will be, begin to walk you through the next steps on, on how do you unwind what has ever, ha what has happened to your, um, to your um, data and your server, your email, whatever it may be. And so what I want to walk through here is just give you some brief examples of various cyber liability claims. I was reading a study not too long ago that um, it was a combination of um, Experian and, and the consulting firm RSM put together. Um, and this study, 98% of the cyber losses that they studied were small to medium-sized businesses. The average incident loss was $175,000. Um, now that incident loss, what, what, what does that include? That's the insurance company providing you a, a data breach coach. That's your forensics, that's your credit and ID monitoring, and that's all your legal and regulatory costs that go into the incident that you've just gone through. Um, and what we see from the insurance side, a lot of folks say, well, I don't need cyber liability. I don't, I don't keep credit cards. I don't, I don't have, I'm not transferring a whole lot of funds back and forth. I, I don't have anything for anybody to take. But it's a lot more than, as Joseph mentioned, they just want to take your, your data, whatever it may be, and, and sell it on the dark web. Um, but as you'll see from a lot of these claims, um, it, it's the notification costs. It, it's a lot of the ancillary costs around cleaning up the claim um, that adds up. Um, so the first one I have, it's a data breach claim uh, from a CPA whose email account was hacked. Um, and he realized that during the claim that some of his clients, W-2s were compromised. So the insurance company um, got a forensic IT person in there. They were able to recognize that yes, these W-2s were taken. Um, so they had to notify 350 individuals. Um, so th for that, they set up a call center um, and a notification uh, email routing to notify these individuals. And then they had to do credit monitoring for a year for these 350 individuals. Uh, the next one I have is, is a hacking malware. Um, this is where a manufacturer outsourced his um, all his third-party IT um, hosting and updates to a um, third-party vendor. Um, and that third-party vendor noticed, notified him that they had been compromised and credit card numbers had been stolen. Um, so the manufacturer reported to his cyber liability policy. They were able to bring in someone to do some IT forensics. And from there, um, they did confirm that credit cards had been stolen, but they also noticed that there was another breach um, that was going on side by side with this. So they eventually were able to figure out 
um, the customers that were impacted. And here, once again, they were able, they had to set up notification to all these clients and set up uh, credit monitoring for over a year for all these folks. Um, so you can imagine the cost that would go into credit monitoring for somebody for over a year and you have to do it for hundreds and thousands of um, clients, it, it adds up. Um, here's one for unintended exclosure, disclosure. Uh, you have a hotel franchise who had a, a computer error that instead of putting the home address in the address location in their computer system, it entered either a credit card number, a passport or a driver's license number in that address field. Well, this hotel chain shared their addresses of their clients with a third party marketing firm. So they had just sent potentially um, credit card numbers, passport numbers and driver's license numbers to a third party. And sure enough, they did it for 30,000 um, individuals to which they had to hire forensics to, figure, to come in and figure out how this happened. And then once again, more credit monitoring and call centers for these individuals to call in um, to make sure that there was no more um, data breach or the, there was no credit harm or ID theft that went on further than what this hotel um, chain already experienced. And here's one for business interruption. Um, a retailer experienced a DDoS um, attack on its website, uh, which lasted for several days. So they had a significant decrease in their web sales. Um, they did not have an extortion demand on this um, and no personal identif personally identifiable information was uh, involved in it, but the uh, retailer engaged an expert to help mitigate the loss. Um, and after a few days, they were able to stop the DDoS attack, um, and this cost them a loss of income of $300,000. So a simple attack that lasted a few days, this online retailer lost out on $300,000 in sales. And then my next one um, is, is very similar, but uh, cyber extortion. This is the classic they have attack the network. They want X amount in Bitcoin. Um, and in this particular lo loss, the insurance company came in and negotiated the ransom and ended up paying 40,000 in Bitcoin to the attacker to free the network back up so the, the client could get back to their normal co course of business. In the social engineering, uh, Joseph gave a, um, a great example of the client that was not following their own protocols um, of a wire transfer. Um, this happens um, very regularly. Um, so the best protocol, I'll, I'll, obviously, with a wire transfer is always to pick up the phone and call the person. Um, but an example I have here is a payroll company that received an email from a fake CEO requesting copies of W-2 forms. Um, and this payroll company emailed out 300 W-2 companies to the fake CEO. Uh, fortunately, after the insurance company did their investigation, the social security numbers were blacked out on the W-2s. Um, so there was not a, a, a privacy lawsuit or a privacy loss from this. Uh, but it's another good example of individuals falling for these fake emails and these, these social engineering campaigns that these bad, act, bad actors are continually coming at us with. Thanks, John. Thanks, uh, Joseph. Appreciate that. Um, I would like to go ahead and open this up to some uh, questions from the audience. If you would, feel free to just use the Q&A box within the Zoom uh, menu to, to submit your questions. We did receive um, a few questions uh, during the webinar itself. And this first one is uh, for you, John. Um, and what's the process like uh, for getting cyber liability insurance? Is there an audit or can anyone sign up for coverage? Uh, anyone can sign up for coverage. Uh, it's, it's a fairly simple process. Um, it really requires, um, depending on the size of the business, an application that is typically two to three pages long. Um, there are some technical questions on there, um, and the folks at SeedSpark can, can help you answer those. Uh, we are seeing more that the insurance companies are requiring 
multi-factor authentication. Um, they are starting to require things like password managers. So we are starting to see the under underwriting requirements go up um, to, to be able to produce a quote, uh, but the process to, to get there is very simple. Excellent. Um, Joseph, uh, for the average business, if they had to focus their cybersecurity efforts on one thing, what would you recommend? So if they had to pick one, uh, I would start with the endpoint management. The reason being is, it's just like I said earlier, the endpoint management will at least cover you uh, if your users are at Starbucks or connecting to uh, McDonald's uh, Wi-Fi or working remotely from their house, even their house uh, internet. So uh, I would pick that first. If I had to pick one, that would be the one that I would start with. Okay. And there's a follow-up question here, uh, Joseph. And uh, when it comes to the cyber threat, what keeps you up at night? Uh, the social engineering, because I can't, I can't, um, that's one thing that I can have all the coolest tools, but I can't stop that. Uh, if people engage with the, the bad guys or, or they provide their own passwords and, and links, I, I can't stop it. Okay, thank you, Joseph. I have a question here from uh, Ron. Uh, uh, John, I think this is for you. Uh, it says, uh, who is liable if an email account is hacked and requested funds and request funds for an open invoice be sent to an illegitimate bank account via ACH and client sends funds without verifying by phone? Well, it would come down to where, where was the compromise? Um, was it on, was the compromise from the email from email going to third party? Um, and so was that person liable for not having the proper protocols in place? And so there was a breach there. And do they have a cyber liability policy um, to cover that? Um, and, and same with um, the person that actually sent the money. Um, if, if they have a policy in place in lieu of the one sending the email, if there is a, a appropriate coverage there, um, that policy would respond. But it would also come down to what what is the what was the trigger? What was the cover cause of loss? Was it social engineering? Was it a data breach, ransomware? What what caused it? And so once you dig into that and figure out, okay, what what's what was the cover cause of loss? And then from there you can say, okay, cover cause of loss was X. It was social engineering. Eighty five thousand dollars were spent. You have a hundred thousand dollar sublimit on your policy. Um, then it will respond. And obviously the insurance company can help you to do some forensics to understand exactly where that, the, the point of the breach occurred. Is that correct? Correct. Very good. All right, John, i got uh, one more question here. Uh, it looks like this is for you. It says, uh, um, it says, would you say to, what would you say to a small business uh, who thinks they're too small for an attack? Uh, no business is too small. Um, we think everybody should carry some level of cyber liability. Um, as Joseph mentioned, it is the bad actors are getting more and more sophisticated. They're always coming up with something new. Um, and most of the cyber losses that the insurance companies are seeing are small businesses because they're the most vulnerable. So that's where they're seeing most of the losses. Um, and so any level of coverage is better than no coverage. You know, to, to add to that, for every colonial pipeline that makes CNN and makes the news and everything, there's a thousand mom and pop, you know, five person, 10 person shops. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, any other questions uh, from the crowd? If not, uh, we'll go to the next slide and, and uh, we'll briefly tell you a little bit about um, some of our solutions that I know SeedSpark can bring to bear. And John, we'll let you kind of touch on um, what, what you guys can do over, over at Lowry. But you know, I will say from a SeedSpark uh, perspective, um, you know, as, as Joseph you know, mentioned, um, 
you know, I don't think we have to keep beating this horse to death, but, but the threat is definitely real, regardless of size and sophistication of your, of your organization. Um, the, uh, there's a recent poll that says there's a cyber, a new cybersecurity attack every 39 seconds, which is insane to me. Um, and I know from a Seeds Park perspective, uh, we have about 300 clients uh, and, and on an average week, uh, we will stop about uh, almost 1,000, 989 phishing attacks every single week uh, for our clients. Uh, but the good news is that there are a variety of tools um, and programs available um, that uh, we can bring to bear uh, to, to help mitigate any risk and, and stop the bad actors uh, before they, they, they can act. Uh, and if you have an interest uh, in discussing how Speed, SeedSpark can assist uh, your business. Uh, the process is, is fairly simple uh, from, from our end. Um, we'll come in, we'll do an assessment um, of your network, um, of your software, and, and, and of your devices to see if, uh, and to identify any vulnerabilities. Um, we'll then help you educate your team. Um, if if uh, it didn't become crystal clear, if social engineering is a, a, a huge uh, risk, um, education is the best way to combat that risk. Uh, so we can go in, uh, help educate your team about the most common threats um, um, and everyday strategies that they can uh, uh, put uh, in place to help keep the bad guys uh, at bay. Uh, and then last, uh, we will uh, implement those technology solutions um, that range from everything from you know, network penetration to email security um, to, to really help protect your business and, and to proactively make sure we stay on, on top of the threat. There is so much activity, the amount of data um, that's coming in and the level of sophistication and the evolution of those, the threat is so fast, no human can keep up with it. And, and that's where um, the tools that we deploy uh, and some of the AI uh, systems that are running behind the, in the background behind those tools really become valuable because not only are they keeping up with the threats, uh, but they're also looking three steps down the road. Um, so if you have any interest in SeedSpark and what we can uh, do, it doesn't hurt to give us a call. We're happy to talk to you. Either email us um, or call the number on the screen and, and we'll be happy to have that conversation. Uh, and John, I will let you have uh, the last word. Okay. So Lowry Insurance, we're, we're an independent insurance agency located in, in Charlotte. Um, and so about 65 of our, the business we do is dealing with business clients. Uh, the other 35% is the personal line side. Um, so we have a number of carriers and we, and we really work with, with about every industry, uh, whether it's manufacturing, wholesale, contractors, technology. Um, so we work with a number of businesses uh, and with a very co consultative approach of, we'd like to meet with you, hear about your needs, your thoughts, your concerns, and then come back to you and, and give you some options. Um, to get, get the best coverage for you for your unique business. Um, and we not only specialize in cyber liability, but general liability, workers' compensation, auto, property. Um, so we can cover um, pretty much any of your business insurance needs. Excellent. Well, John, Joseph, really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you to everybody who attended today's uh, webinar. Uh, we really appreciate you taking a, a part of your afternoon to spend with us, and we hope it was helpful. If we can do anything to help you out, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and be on the lookout uh, for an email, uh, which will include a, a link to this recording, um, or feel free to request one uh, at your leisure. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.